Welcome to our first breakout session. My name is Rick Walker. I'm president of the Georgia Automotive Manufacturers Association. Uh, we're a relatively newly formed organization and I'm very proud to say we're the newest and fastest growing automotive supplier organization in the entire United States. Uh, we started out in 2010, we're already up to about 150 members, uh, and I do recognize some of you in the room, and I thank you for your support. Uh, we have a phenomenal panel for you this morning that I think is going to satisfy all your expectations. Um, uh, the format this morning is I will introduce each of the speakers by way of a brief biography. The three speakers seems to be cutting in and out. Uh, each of the three speakers will give a brief PowerPoint presentation uh, running somewhere in the range of 10 to 15 minutes each, uh, followed by Q&A after they're all done. So if you could just please hold your questions, but we do want to allow plenty of time for questions. So uh, again, general format, uh, introductions by me, 10 minutes or so from each speaker, and then Q&A. And feel free to ask uh, whatever you like. Uh, our focus here is, of course, on uh, you know, logistics, sustainable competition. The fact that you're here means that you survived the last couple of years, and congratulations on that. So uh, happy to have you here at this conference. Uh, let me start out with our first speaker. Uh, Tim Quinn is with Porsche Cars North America. He's vice president of After Sales. And in each case here, I'm not going to uh, give you the full biography. You each have a... Uh, a handout that gives that detail, but Tim currently serves as Bryce, Vice President After Sales for Porsche Cars North America, and he's held that since 2007. Uh, he is responsible for all internal developments related to dealer and field support, in the areas of parts and service. Our second speaker will be Michael Smith. Michael is here from Volkswagen Group of America Operations. He's an assistant manager for logistics. He's responsible for all domestic and international transportation operations, both inbound and outbound for VW. Uh, this includes procurement strategy, supplier readiness, warehouse administration, third-party logistics, supply chain management, hazmat compliance, and network design. Wonder what he does in his spare time. Man, that's a lot. <laughs> uh, Alan Horn uh, is with Suzuki Manufacturing of America. Alan is global sales supervisor, and I've got to uh, compliment him, one of the very first members of Gamma. So thank you very much, Alan. Uh, Alan is the global sales supervisor for Suzuki, uh, an all-terrain vehicle manufacturer located in Rome, Georgia. He'll give you more detail on his operations and responsibilities, and they are awesome. So without any further ado, I'd like to start with Tim. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, can you hear me okay? Would you rather I speak with a microphone? Okay. Good. Because I would, well, no? I think not? Okay, good. Well, anyway, good morning, everybody. We're glad that you're here. Uh, I would like to welcome you on behalf of Porsche Cars North America to our hometown, Atlanta, Georgia. So we're glad that you would be with us. Now, I know a lot of you are probably thinking, Atlanta, really? Is that where you're located? Absolutely, because Atlanta has turned out to be almost the ideal place for us to be headquartered in North America. Uh, you may know that prior to being here and moving here 13 years ago, we were headquartered in Reno, Nevada. And the main reason that we moved to Atlanta was because we got tired of asking or answering the question, why Reno? Uh, so we decided we better move someplace that had a little credibility and frankly was a lot easier to get to Germany, to talk to Germany, to service our dealers, and to be in a much more dynamic environment to, uh, to do our business and to be able to attract talent. So anyway, a very brief overview uh, about Porsche Cars in North America and specifically how we handle our parts logistics. A few foundational elements for you, if you please, just so you understand who we are and what we do. First, Porsche Logistics Services is our wholly owned subsidiary of Porsche Cars North America that handles our parts distribution and warehousing. Uh, when Porsche Cars North America was originally established back in 1984, we handled all of our parts logistics through two centers, one in Reno, one in Charleston, South Carolina. 
As our business had its ups and downs, we eventually consolidated those only into a Reno operation. But then as we moved our headquarters to Atlanta, it became apparent to us we needed to revisit how we handle parts distribution. Our first decision, which apparently was not the best one at the time, was to go with a 3PL. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but quite frankly, the way we prepared ourselves for it didn't work out so well in the long run. So eventually, we decided that we needed to take back over distribution of parts, but we would do it in our own, in, in our own subsidiary, much like a, a dedicated 3PL. So in March of 2002, we established Porsche Logistics Services based here in Atlanta. Now, again, PLS is responsible for warehousing, distribution, inventory control, and transportation for 201 Porsche dealers in the United States and Canada. And we do that with three different uh, parts distribution centers. One here in Atlanta, one in eastern Pennsylvania, which is just north of Philadelphia, one in Ontario, California, which is just outside of Los Angeles. Now, the other thing that's very unique about our operation is that not only do we ship to Porsche dealers nationwide, we also ship to independent repair facilities on an as-needed basis. So what that means is that during the course of a day, we may get a parts order drop that says, could you ship this particular small box of parts to Stuttgart Auto House in Jackson, Mississippi? And our system has to be flexible enough to handle that order along with the regular stock orders and emergency orders for our dealers. So that's something that's a little bit unusual about how we do business. But one of the things that we do, we think incredibly well, and allows us an opportunity to have some service that just isn't available everywhere. It keeps us hopping, though. I will admit that. Now, a couple of things you should know. Uh, like most businesses, we're constantly in transition. We can't stay still and be able to meet the needs of our dealers and our customers. So a couple of things have happened here. Our original Porsche Parts Distribution Center here in Atlanta was only 80,000 square feet. Back in June of 2005, we bumped that up significantly because of not only the growth of our business, but also the idea that we were going to use Atlanta as our home base or maybe our master warehouse, so to speak. So if there is a part that we have in any of the three PDCs, but only one, more than likely it lives here in Atlanta so that we can redistribute as necessary. Next thing is, our California operation originally started in a uh, 46,000 square foot facility and then we bumped it up to 130,000 square feet back in December of 2005. Again, for a lot of the same reason. The growth in our business was pretty phenomenal at that point. And the other thing is, as you might imagine, there are more Porsches in California than anywhere else in the world. So it was important that we have an opportunity to have high fill rates and good service levels for our dealers on the west coast of uh, the United States. Then beyond that, our most recent uh, move was into eastern Pennsylvania back in August of 2009, again with a, uh, a multi-use facility, and I'll explain that in a little more detail in a few moments. 130,000 square feet there. Uh, again, newest facility, incorporating the things that we've learned in the other facilities. Uh, this particular operation is very similar to the one that is in Ontario, California, in fact that it's mixed use. The facility here in Atlanta is solely dedicated to the distribution of automotive parts, so we do no other uh, functions within that facility. So, I'd like to talk for just a second about our organizational structure because Porsche Logistics Services, as I said, is in fact a wholly owned subsidiary of Porsche Cars North America. The real key that I would point out here is that we're a pretty lean organization. And that is the Porsche way. That is how we like to do business. Uh, and I'm sure that most of you in the logistics business have found the need to, uh, to continually look for those ways to get lean and mean and, in order to be able to survive. And that's exactly the way we do it. Now, one of the uh, key factors here is that it functions just like a 3PL and such that it has a board of directors and it has a, uh, a very key position here of general manager. And that general manager is Rob Nimchik, who is here in the front row. And I will tell you that uh, without him and the talent that he brings to the operation, everything else would just be a mess. So we are uh, very happy to have Rob. And he works very closely with operations managers in the three facilities here. I'll point out, too, that we have a logistics analyst 
that is constantly looking at how we are warehousing parts, what we have where, is it the right way, is this the most efficient way for us to do business, and of course with changes in our business where we have different sales, we introduce new models, we have different needs, we are in a constant state of flux regarding where a part might be on a shelf, which location, which warehouse, which day. So that's kind of a critical role for us to maintain our efficiency. Second thing, a transportation manager. Uh, as most of you know, when you're talking about the logistics business, outbound transportation is an incredible cost factor. And if you're not watching every cent, every day, looking for ways to make that better, clearly we're in trouble. That's where we can gain a lot of efficiencies. And in fact, I would point out here that we have had more gains in this area than anywhere else in our operation. So, again, one thing you should know, 80 people in total, including all of the management staff throughout the three PDCs, we use some casual labor as necessary, and we like to try to keep a very nice, lean uh, team on board to uh, keep us going here. So, you might ask yourself, how do you cover, uh, how do you cover the United States and Canada with just three parts distribution centers? And I don't know about your particular business, but it's uh, quite a feat for us to do this because what happens in the automobile business, as my colleagues here know as well, there is minimal understanding of why I don't have what I need when I need it or immediately thereafter. So the key that we have here is uh, we have zoned the continent, as I'm sure many of you do in your business, uh, but what you can see is that the supply lines from some of these distribution centers to the dealers is incredibly long. And that obviously creates some, some challenges for us in making sure that we can be efficient, making sure that we can keep our service levels up and that we can meet the demands of our customers. Uh, I talked about how we're constantly looking at how we manage that inventory and where the pieces are on the shelf. We do the same thing on the logistics side as far as outbound freight. Our transportation manager is on an ongoing basis looking for ways that we can maximize our service level, minimize ship times, minimize the cost. Of course, always with overriding concern, are we serving our customer? So uh, big challenge, I'm sure. Again, some of you are faced with the same type of thing. Um, and, uh, we, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on. We ask ourselves, is this optimal? I don't know, but we'll come back to that. I wanted to show you, though, uh, what typically a facility might look like for us. And this is the Eastern Pennsylvania facility, our newest. And uh, when I talked earlier about it being mixed use, what you see here is actually what we refer to as an area office. Most car companies that operate in America have regional or zone offices scattered around, as do we. And in this particular case, for the eastern or northeastern United States, uh, the management and the, uh, the field traveling team live in this office here. Uh, what you can't see so well in this photograph, even though you see the windows there, that actually is a showroom environment inside. So what we're able to do is if we need to have a dealership meeting or if we want to do a sales training event, we have the facility right there so that we can set it up just like a dealership and bring people into that environment. It's also a pretty cool place for us to park some cars so we can walk by and see why we're there on a regular basis. Uh, what you can't see in this facility, but you, I'm sure you can imagine, is uh, the big box back here is Parts Distribution Center. Um, it's very clean, it's very neat, it's very organized, but it's like most distribution centers, probably not the sexiest thing you've ever seen, okay? But it's very straightforward and efficient. What uh, we have along this side of the building is a service training center. We have the ability to train Porsche dealer technicians from the various dealerships in the northeastern United States, and we have ongoing classes there. Any given point in time, we probably have 20 to 25 Porsche technicians who would be here learning how to service our automobiles. Uh, and this is an operation that goes year-round, as you might imagine, with a variety of different subjects. Right at the moment, they are teaching as fast and as hard as they can on our new 911, which was just launched this weekend, because we want to make sure the dealers are capable of servicing them. So at the end of the day, this type of facility is ultimately what we believe works best for us, not just from a logistics viewpoint, but from bringing the other elements together under what we would refer to here as a... Uh, is a, a retail support facility. So like I say, parts distribution center, 
training center, area sales and service office, all at one location. Now, I did mention earlier that's not the setup here in Atlanta. It's a little bit unique because this is our headquarters, and we're also going to have other uh, issues that we have to take care of, like a technical support office. And with our headquarters here and the new development that we'll be doing over by the warehouse in the coming months, our configuration in Atlanta will be a little bit unique. But this serves us well in both Ontario and Easton. So, a few extra bits about who we are and what we do. Uh, fortunately, we've had eight consecutive years with a positive return on sales. That is thanks largely to Rob and his team, more than anything else, watching every penny we spend. A lot of times people take it that because Porsche is a big, big name and a big brand and that we sell expensive products that money is no object. I assure you that is not the case. Uh, the Schwabians from South Germany are basically the Scottish of Germany, okay? We watch every penny we spend, and if it wasn't for Rob and his team, uh, this type of return on sales would not be possible for us. Something that contributes to that is that Rob and his team declared what they call a war on claims several years ago, and every day Every year, they are concentrated on reducing mispicks and on making sure that the packaging and the transportation is such that the part arrives to the dealership without need for any type of claim or replacement. And you can say, well, that's great. It saves some money, and every one of you I know in your business can see the benefit of that. But let me tell you an additional benefit. When you have a customer with a $150,000 automobile that is waiting for a part that's got their baby in the shop and not on the road, they are not very understanding as to why the part got their damage. So it's a huge concern for us. Uh, but the good news here is when we're looking for efficiency, not only do we find the efficiency, but we also improve our service level to the customer. Rob's team's turnover rate's less than 3%. I think that if we look back at some of the early challenges we had when we first established PLS, we had a lot of churn. And to be sure, what we found, and I'm sure you see it in your own businesses, is that when we have a stable workforce and we have people who understand what's expected of them and have true responsibility and accountability, it makes it a lot easier to do good things and to achieve high return on sales and low claims and, and high levels of efficiency. So thanks to Rob and his team, again, an incredibly stable workforce. One of the things, and I mentioned this earlier when we were talking about efficiencies, is we believe in dedicated delivery. Now that's not a new concept in the automobile business or in a lot of other businesses. But remember back that map that I showed you a few minutes ago. And remember how far some of those distances were away from where those parts distribution centers were. We do dedicated delivery for almost 80% of our sales volume from those three PDCs. We do dedicated delivery every day out of Atlanta, Georgia, to Chicago, to the upper Midwest, to Dallas, Texas. Um, now, we couldn't always do that. Part of the beauty of it is, is that we, we never take good enough for granted. We are always looking for a way to find another transportation partner or find some synergy somewhere that says we can get to two or three more dealers we can get there overnight. And so essentially, these dealers will have a part shipment leave the PDC every night, 5 o'clock, depending on where they are. It's delivered overnight. At the very, very further set of our uh, dealers on the inventory chain, you'll probably see a delivery in Dallas in mid-morning, 10 o'clock. But it's still much better than we were able to uh, do to them previously. Again, we, we never take good enough as an answer We've got 137 dealers on dedicated delivery. We're starting nine more in Ohio in just a few weeks. Uh, and we're probably not going to rest until we've got 201 served this way. I'd like to mention one other thing, too. You know, Porsche is recognized as a performance brand and a performance company. Performance is not just about sheer power. It also has a lot to do with efficiency. And we believe that environmental responsibility is really at the center of efficiency as well. When we look at our operation, we look at our products, it's important that we take this seriously and that we not just pay lip service to it. So a couple of things that we've done, big ones, 
That facility I showed you earlier is the first and only Porsche facility in the world that's LEED Gold certified. Okay? Now, we didn't have to do that, but we thought it was the right thing to do. And it is an incredible facility. Uh, I'm particularly impressed with the idea that we have showers for the employees, so if you want to ride your bike to work, you have the ability to clean up before you come to work. That's, that was pretty important to me. So the other thing that's a, a pretty big sign of our commitment to environmental responsibility is a 80 kilowatt solar array on the roof of our facility in Ontario, California. Um, again, it's not something that we had to do. You may say, does it really make a difference in your operation? Yeah. It contributes to the operation. It contributes to our efficiency there. But at the end of the day, it also says that we take environmental uh, matters seriously. But as you know, it's not always about the big swing. Sometimes it's about small things. We converted over to high efficiency lighting systems in all of our facilities that are on a motion control. That way, not only do we have the ability to, to do better and more efficient work in the uh, warehouse, because you can see what you're doing, but we also are able to do it with reduced energy usage. And something, again, as far as uh, trying to be efficient, looking for recycled materials, either things that have been recycled or that could be easily recycled. Um, there are not always big solutions to big issues, so every little bit that we do counts, and we take nothing for granted here. And finally, one other thing that we're incredibly proud of, and that is that our team members and their management team within the Porsche Parts Distribution Centers are very community focused. And they believe in trying to be active in what's going on in their neighborhood, trying to help take care of their own as well as the people that work around them. And you always know that there's something more you could do there, but we appreciate the fact that they make this a regular part of their focus in doing business and in being good corporate citizens. So I think I would tell you that that's kind of it from my side as a high-level overview. I hope I haven't bored you too much. Uh, and there's plenty of time for some questions and answers. So with that, Michael, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Tim, possibly while I'm changing the, the PowerPoint deck and before Michael starts, could you just answer one question for me? How will the world cover the entire U.S. and Canada from just three centers? That's a, that's a logistics. But it, it is a very, very difficult operation, as, as we've said. And what it means is that, uh, of course, we continue to look for those ways to get the dedicated delivery. We are continually looking at how we balance the cost factor and the efficiency side versus serving our customers, which I told you was incredibly important to us. And realistically, we have to be concerned about where we're going in the future as a brand. So we know that we expect a lot of growth in the next six years. So we are currently looking at, are we in the right places the right ways? Uh, do we have all of the right components in place to make sure our customers are taken care of? The real key is you never take it for granted. Every day you ask yourself the question, is this the best we can be? Thank you. Thank you. Hey, good morning. My name is Michael Smith. I'm with the Volkswagen Group in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I'll try not to put anybody to sleep this morning, but I want to talk to you about the current status of Volkswagen in the world and what we're doing in Chattanooga with the launch of our new plant. So what is the Volkswagen Group? Can anybody tell me any other brand or label in Volkswagen other than Volkswagen itself? Not yet, <laughs> but we're close. <laughs> There's the, the major brands in the Volkswagen group. It's, uh, you have the sophistication and styling of the Bentley uh, and the Bugatti group. You have superior engineering and performance in Audi and Lamborghini. The reliability of Seat, Skoda, and Scania. And most recently this year, the Mon group for heavy trucking. So Volkswagen employs over 500,000 employees in the world. So it's a huge company, uh, and we're getting larger every day. In 2011, we sold over a million units more than we did in 2010. Pretty good in a recession. Uh, we're expanding. We're the second largest car company in the world. So total sales grew by 14.3% overall. We hope by 2018 to be selling 10 million units worldwide. 
And I, I think we'll get there probably before 2018 with our recent investment in China and the U.S. The U.S. is a very small market for us. We only have less than 3% of the overall volume in the United States. So our ability to grow here is going to be tremendous in Chattanooga is just the start. So we're more than just Chattanooga. We have 6,500 employees in the U.S. and distribution centers across the country. Only the one plant for now. Uh, but you can see we have, a, we have a, a nationwide presence from east to west and north to south. So Chattanooga. Chattanooga was an experiment for us. I don't know if anybody remembers back in the 80s our, our calamity in Pennsylvania, but uh, it was a very bad experiment for us and it failed. We were focused on making Chattanooga work and uh, it's easily, easier said than done with you have a clash of cultures, you have a sophisticated market in the United States that, do, that does things a certain way and then you have the German way which is the way we're doing it now. So, <laughs> I'm an old GM Chrysler guy, so I was kind of set in my ways when I came here. So, uh, but uh, I found out I wasn't too old to learn. So we had uh, 1,400 acres in Tennessee, a little over a billion dollars in investment. Uh, our capacity is 150,000 units per year, and everything is new there. The people, the processes, the parts, so it was like starting all over. We didn't have a supplier base here other than a few suppliers in Mexico that supply Puebla to choose from. So we were very ambitious in some of the processes we attempted to install from the beginning. I don't know if any of you are familiar with progress lanes or shipping to a progress lane, but it's very ambitious for a startup organization. So that was our plan from the beginning. Our sourcing, to ship to Progress Lanes, one of the mandates is all your suppliers have to be within 250 miles of your location. So you can see we, we accomplished that with about 22% of our suppliers. Uh, the majority of our suppliers are still in Europe and in Mexico. Uh, the majority of the volume is within 250 miles, but that creates its own problems also. So you have a large volume with very few suppliers and you had very little volume with the, your major uh, majority of suppliers throughout the country. So what we intended to do from the beginning was expanded by the availability of suppliers in the region. And that's part of the, why we're here today, is because we need more suppliers and we need more sourcing from this region. It helps us with our costs, it helps us with our strategy, and that's where we want to move forward with. So regional strategy is a big part of what we want to do in Chattanooga. So we're building approximately 582 vehicles per day. We moved over 27 million miles in billable freight in 2011. So 27 million miles is, uh, is quite substantial at a build rate of 582 cars per day. So we, we obviously will want to reduce that. So going forward, uh, I think average 192, yeah, it's right there, I'm sorry, 192 miles per vehicle in content when we move the transportation to build a car, which we should be less than 100 there. So in addition to our, uh, our domestic routes, we do move uh, CKD import routes. Uh, we move from Japan, we move from China, uh, we move from Brazil, different parts of the country. So one of our big success stories in 2010 and 2011 was our relationship with the Georgia Port Authority. Um, we could have taken our freight anywhere on the East Coast or West Coast for that matter, but it was the ability of Cliff and Curtis at the Georgia Port Authority that really swayed us. And that relationship that we've built with them has been beneficial to both us and both to Georgia. So uh, I think it's a long-term agreement with them and uh, we're looking forward to dredging the port and moving even more freight through there. So what does that mean? 2011, we, we actually ramped up to about 500 containers uh, per quarter. In 2012, we're going to export or, and import 
approximately 3,000 containers. So you can see the growth uh, of the amount of parts and the amount that we're moving through uh, <coughs> Savannah. So back to our original concept. Uh, we were shipping directly to P lanes on a daily basis. So we, we were shipping to 24 different P lanes. Long distance, low frequency suppliers would ship either to the trailer yard, to one of our two cross docks, a remote cross dock or a local cross dock. Local high frequency suppliers would ship directly into the trailer yard uh, or to the local cross dock. And then we have so our just jet suppliers that ship directly into the plant. And then one of the major findings that we found in, in Chattanooga was we just thought if we're in a recession, there's just going to be unlimited amount of warehouse space close to the plant. We got there, there was nothing. So we ended up constructing a supplier part for our CKD part, about 500,000 square feet that we move all of our CKD parts and sea freight through. We have a very uh, sophisticated and specific delivery method to how we deliver parts to the plant. We use specialized conestogas and curtain sides to deliver our body weld parts directly to the body shop. Um, we use dry vans to deliver directly into the assembly, but unlike, that was another lesson learned that we had, that domestic suppliers don't load or unload parts on curtain sides. Everybody loads and unloads from rear. So we, we put together the European plan, basically, that says we're going to unload everything on the curtain sides and side loads. And we showed up the suppliers, and they kind of looked at us like, well, how are we going to load that? So, <laughs> so, but it worked for us. We worked with the suppliers. We worked with the specialized equipment. We, we have a very unique way that we deliver parts based. We, we choose the, the transportation based on the type of part, the equipment that the part goes on, and the delivery method. So it's a very sophisticated delivery method to the plant. And that's just, if you don't know what kind of is, that's a kind of stove. That's a fancy curtain sign. So part of those lessons learned, stable part supply without major and sudden changes. I mean, that, that should be common sense, but it was something that we were surprised by. Uh, new systems, new parts, new suppliers cause wild fluctuations in our build schedule, uh, our inventory accuracy, and our whole logistics change. So that, that, that was something that we weren't prepared for. Buffer for suppliers are outside the 300 mile radius. Take the local automotive culture into consideration. Part protection, side load trailers, I mean, I think you really have to do your research on who your suppliers are and work a partnership with them to be successful. Uh, the aforementioned lack of rentable warehouse space, which is still an issue for us going forward. Anybody got a warehouse in Chattanooga they want to rent? <laughs> um, and our ramp up concept. Uh, uh, we were very aggressive in what we wanted to do, and I think sometimes you should take a step back and, and take your time and do it correctly, more as in to be gung-ho in your launches. So. so what does that mean for opportunities in 2012? We want to develop relationships with regional service providers that give us long-term synergies for both companies. We're looking for relationships to work with suppliers going forward in the region. Uh, additional sourcing through Savannah. I mean, the, this that relationship, and, and we're being so pleased with the service and everything that we've accomplished there with the Port of Georgia. Working with the Customs and Border Patrol to establish a FTZ zone in Chattanooga, and then localizations of the services in the southeast, southeast region. So, so that's it. Uh, <laughs> any questions? Thank you, Michael. I'll, I'll, while I'm changing over the PowerPoint slides, uh, just one question that I have is what, what one quality would make a logistics supplier stand out from, from others that you see? I, I would say honesty and reliability, which is uh, not to say that most suppliers aren't honest and reliable, but there's different levels of service. And I think we're, we're all in a service organization, whether it be sales and of the sites or if it's supplying parts. So at the end of the day, 
if it's truly a working relationship, that you're going to get out of it what you put into it. And I think that's that's what we're looking for people to work with going forward. Yes. Timing. Uh, Alan. Gentlemen, uh, Michael, Tim, let me also, first of all, thank you for uh, allowing me to also be up here on this stage with you. I can tell you it's been a great pleasure and a great honor to be up here with you. It's also been interesting comparing uh, your presentation so far to what I had in mind. Uh, I noticed a lot of similarities in uh, some of the things that we're dealing with, of course, but even some specific similarities, um, like the 3D seats. That's what we're working with for parts distribution as well. Uh, the need for closer suppliers. My God, we're talking about that kind of thing every day in our company. So yes, uh, there's certainly some similarities, specifically and also in culture. When you said curtain size, I almost fell out of my chair because that's something that uh, is uh, common sense in Japan, but it just doesn't make sense here uh, in the United States so much. Thank you, Rick, also for uh, the kind introduction there a little earlier. And uh, let me also mention that when uh, Paige Siplon first invited me to come here, I uh, gave a little, oh, there's Paige right over there. Yes, thank you very much, Paige. <laughs> And he explained a little bit of the concept. He explained that uh, we would be uh, logistics users up here on the stage and that we would have a room full of logistics providers listening to uh, the kinds of things and the issues that we were dealing with. And as I listened to this explanation and I started to imagine what it was that I needed to do to present to everybody here, it occurred to me that we're going to be up here like a bunch of sheep <laughs> and we're going to have a room full of salivating wolves just dying to jump up and, and provide their services to us. And I, I must tell you, I'm um, here yeah. as expected. But I must tell you, you all look a whole lot kinder than the uh, salivating wolves that I was imagining. So, but really, thank you all also for coming to see us here today. Of course, you had uh, several choices to uh, uh, decide upon, and you, uh, it's. Uh, of course, a positive thing for us that you come here to listen to us and what we have to say here today. So thank you very much. As Rick mentioned a little while ago, I, I do have uh, the responsibility for our global sales coming out of the factory, Suzuki Manufacturing, which is actually an ATV producer. We do put four wheels on the product, and of course, there are a lot of similarities in the autom automotive business, which is part of why I'm here. Before I talk specifically about our factory, let me talk a little bit about our uh, headquarters, and which one of these is progressing the... Uh, uh, just to that the right? one, yes. Yeah. Okay. And corners in the middle. Okay, there we go. About our headquarters, Suzuki Manufacturing, um, Suzuki Motor Corporation in Japan. You can see uh, we produce, oh, I'm sorry, we uh, employ 45,000 people worldwide, and these are in 35 main production facilities around the world, located in 23 different countries. Here in the United States, there's just the one facility, and of course that's Suzuki Manufacturing located in Rome. We used to have a, a joint venture operation with GM in Ingersoll, Canada, and of course uh, with the, the various issues that went on with GM and the divestiture there, we ultimately also divested ourselves of that joint venture. Annually, in our worldwide production, we are of course making automobiles, 2.5 million of them around the world, None of them here in Georgia, of course, but 2.5 million around the world. And a lot of that uh, production is concentrated in Asia, <clears throat> India, China, Indonesia, those areas. And then another thing up there is we're making motorcycles. A little bit different from our friends at Porsche and at uh, uh, Volkswagen, of course. But we, uh, one of, I believe, the three what we call six-wheel manufacturers and we produce both automobiles and motorcycles, the others being Honda and uh, BMW, at least that I can think of, and there may be others out there that I haven't, that hasn't occurred to me, but we do jokingly refer to ourselves as a six-wheel producer sometimes. On the other side, we do have a brand presence in every country around the world except the newest one, which is uh, the split, I believe, in Somalia. So 192 countries around the world, we have brand presence, and as I understand, there are 193. You notice up there then, of course, that we've got a uh, discussion about automobiles and motorcycles. Let me tell you a little bit more about the automobile side there and how we are in relation to our friends such as uh, over here at Volkswagen. 
Suzuki is, uh, I think you said that you were producing about 8 million uh, per year, right? Correct. And we're producing, as we say, 2.5 million around the year, annual, uh, around the world annually. That puts us in fourth among the Japanese automobile, automobile producers. So Toyota, Honda, Nissan, and then Suzuki. And among the global automobile producers, we are in ninth place, again, with regard to the total volume of production. Our company, of course, has uh, been around uh, for quite a while, and uh, we just celebrated, if you could say celebrated, our 100th anniversary in 2009. That was just as the economy was really turning down, so we didn't do much celebrating at all, but we're now 103 years old. Now, as I mentioned then, of course, we're producing automobiles, motorcycles. We also produce marine products and ATVs. With the ATVs, they're produced in one of three locations. child size ATVs are being produced in Taiwan. The sport ATVs are being produced in Japan, and then the utility ATVs, which actually take a large share of the market, they are being produced just here in Rome, Georgia. So let me tell you a little bit more then about our company, Suzuki Manufacturing. So we are a wholly owned subsidiary of Suzuki Motor Corporation, and we were established and located in Rome, Georgia in 2001. You can see there from the slide, of course, we account for 75% of Suzuki's worldwide ATV production. Again, the utility ATV is the main ATV uh, as far as popularity, and that's uh, why we reached that uh, portion of 75%. The reason for us locating here in the United States, of course, was that this was also, and still is, the premier market for ATVs. Whether they be sport, whether they be child, whether they be util utility ATVs, the U.S. is the biggest and best place to be if you're going to get in the ATV market. Our reason for being in the southeast, of course, of various issues, things related to uh, labor, of course, had a, a big uh, attraction for us, availability of a, a, a ready-to-go workforce, and then, of course, the people in the state of Georgia and programs such as the Quick Start program were another big reason for us coming here. Let's see. I noticed... I believe you were talking about uh, CKD production, and that's another thing that we also follow. It's a CKD model. Uh, the engines for Suzuki's ATVs are being produced in the engine factory in Japan. They're then placed on a ship, and they're sent over here to us here in the United States. Other parts are also coming from other countries around the world, from Thai, uh, Taiwan, from China, from Thailand, and of course, uh, closer locations also, Mexico, for example and then a little further away over in Indonesia. These parts are all coming from across the world from what is essentially the east around and through to the port of Savannah. And again, another similarity there, of course, is the use of the port of Savannah. Domestically, we have uh, around 40 uh, providers of the parts here in the U.S. and we're using a, a specific third-party logistics provider to help us bring those parts into us here at uh, Rome, Georgia, through use of their milk runs and their crosstalks. Let's see, what else can I tell you here? Oh yes, of course, on the outbound side. We are exporting our ATVs to about 50 to 60 companies and countries worldwide. Most of those importers, they're major importers of major products. Uh, it's very common for somebody who's importing a Suzuki ATV to also be the importer of the Mercedes-Benz brand the exclusive importer in that particular country. Sometimes they're also industrial importers. They're importing products such as uh, the Caterpillar brand. And again, they're exclusive importers not only of those products, but also of our product. One thing that is always common, though, is that we make sure that the retail of this does follow the dedicated uh, dealer distribution model. So it's always going through a retail channel that involves a dealer, which again, it must be very similar to a channel as well. Now, when we were listening to our keynote speaker there a little earlier, Mr. Curtis Spencer, I believe, most of you have probably heard him, and uh, I was also, again, almost falling out of my chair as I listened to some of those things because they're so relevant to what we are experiencing in our operation here. So uh, let me talk a little bit more now about what works for us logistically and then some of the challenges we face. And I think as I talk about these things, you will recall back to some of the issues that uh, Mr. Spencer was talking about earlier today.
Now, as you look up on that chart, or I'm sorry, that slide there, you're going to say to yourself, what? What are all those words up there? Where's the chart? Where's the hub and spoke diagram on top of the map? Where's the chart about the number of TEUs which are being exported and how many uh, trucks are being delivered through what number of bays coming out of our factory? And it occurred to me, again, as I was uh, thinking about who I'd be presenting to here, that what would really work would not be those numbers, but instead uh, something very basic and very simple. So I've taken the billboard sign advertising approach to the explanation here. Probably many of you know that with a, a billboard, you need to limit the number of words on there to between eight and ten words. And I think, what do I have up here? Probably about ten words on that one. So what works for us then on the inbound side? We've already talked about uh, Savannah being a, a common popular choice. Let me talk a little bit about our West Coast experience in relation to that. When we started in 2001, we said to ourselves, what's logical? Consider the frequency of vessels coming across from Asia. And remember now, I've talked about the fact that a lot of our parts are coming from Asia. They're coming across the Pacific. Given the vessel frequency, it made sense to have them come in through the West Coast, West Coast ports, onto rail, and then down to us here in Rome, Georgia. What we found, though, in practice over several years was that uh, we were often dealing with labor issues in any of the West Coast ports. Strikes, other issues were holding up our parts there in the uh, West Coast port. And of course, this was ultimately affecting our uh, production line. Even after the parts got out of the port, we felt we were still dealing with issues related to the rail. The rail delivery just wasn't working for us very well. It was often weather related, and I understand it was out of control of the, uh, of the rail lines, but not only in winter with the snow, but we were also dealing with issues in the summer where the rails are melting and they can't travel on a particular route. These things then ultimately led us to redirect all of our shipments through the Port of Savannah. And I tell you, that's got to be one of the best choices we've made because ever since we've done that, probably four years ago now, I don't think we've had a single issue for the parts going through Savannah. Now, I'm sure all of you are thinking that I'm about to collect a check from the uh, Port Authority of Savannah, but I tell you that's not the case. But I, I haven't even met anybody here from the Port of Savannah here today, but I just want to let you know that is the true voice of the customer there. We are very, very happy, of course, with what's gone on in, in uh, the Port of Savannah. We also use uh, returnable packaging. I think that we touched on that a little bit there. And I think what's uh, worthy of mention here is we use the returnable packaging for not only our domestic inbound shipments, but also our international shipments. Engines and other parts which are coming to us from across the Pacific, they're going in in returnable racks. Those racks are collapsing. We're putting them back in the same container that they came in, and we're ship shipping them back. Now, of course, we're not using every container. The utilization is probably one out of every four containers. Four inbound, one exbound on that returnable packaging for the international pack uh, suppliers that we're using. And then, of course, I mentioned earlier, we have a 3PL a logistics provider. I won't say their name specifically, but I, I must tell you again, we're very, very satisfied with them and uh, their uh, services that they provide to us through their cross docks and their milk runs really help to make uh, things work for us very efficiently. Of course, I talked about the impact of uh, some of the things such as the uh, West Coast ports problems we had earlier. That provider was able to help us get past a lot of those problems. <coughs> Issues and uh, problems and uh, or challenges, if uh, we should call it that. Again, there's another six to eight to ten words up there, but look at those. There's nothing new up there. Every automobile supplier in the world and every automobile manufacturer in the world is probably dealing with those very kinds of issues. None of that's very new to you. Volume. Need I say more? We're all struggling for volume and getting enough volume to not only keep the assembly line running at an efficient pace, but also to cube out. And it's an, an issue which I'm sure every one of you are familiar with. The sourcing issues, I think I want to just touch on that uh, real briefly. Catastrophic sourcing issues. Just one year ago, of course, there was a huge earthquake and then uh, followed by a, a double whammy after that. So the triple whammy there in Japan that everybody thinks about. Uh, we also have had uh, the flooding in Thailand very recently. And, and those things, those issues did affect our own operation greatly as well as, I think, probably all of the manufacturers, perhaps you gentlemen as well. 
But there's also the traditional issues that we're dealing with. And let's just take a real world example, an inbound vessel that's coming from Japan. It leaves the port of Yokohama and it's held up by a typhoon. Halfway across the Pacific, it has a medical emergency. They're diverted to uh, within reach of a helicopter to remove somebody from the vessel. And then finally, as they're reaching the ports, um, uh, this side, they have an oil leak. The, boat, the whole vessel is quarantined. And that adds two to three weeks to the entire trip of that vessel. That kind of thing, a more typical, if you want, it's hardly a catastrophic issue, a more typical kind of issue, but it's something that we are dealing with constantly. And anybody who's involved with stuff being moved across the ocean is probably dealing with that too. What do you need in these cases? Well, you need time to be able to figure out how to react to those traditional issues and how to proact or be proactive about those larger scale issues. So what here is really different, the difference is uh, very little. It's just a matter of the scale or the scope, the amount of uh, time that you can invest on something traditional or the greater amount of time necessary to be invested on something like the catastrophic issues. Again, let me point out a real world example with a can uh, catastrophic issue. Two and a half years ago, I think, maybe close to three years ago, there was an earthquake in North Japan. And that earthquake knocked out the production capacity, the production capability of a piston ring supplier. Again, we are greatly affected by that. And as we start to peel back the layers of uh, what's going on here, of course, they're not our primary nor secondary supplier, they're a tertiary supplier. And we come to find, along with practically every other Japanese manufacturer and, and several overseas manufacturer, that they are the sole supplier of those rings which go on the pistons, which go on our engines. How far down do we need to drill to be uh, able to, uh, to uncover these issues and make sure that we're able to proactively eliminate them? It, it takes a lot of time, a lot of investment to be able to do that. So what is the key here? Flexibility is the key. When we encounter these issues, who are we going to? We are going to you, our logistics providers, to help us to, of course, deal with it. We're going to ask you to slow down shipments in some cases or speed up shipments in some cases. We're going, of course, to the suppliers of the other parts as well. But without you, the logistics providers, and your ability to stage parts for us, to stop parts for us, to store parts for us, we can't get past these issues. On the outbound side, again, this is a discussion of what works and then what the uh, issues are for us. Um, use of a 3PL warehouse. Now, I think there's an important difference right there between the other two gentlemen here on the stage and my product in that with an automobile, after it's produced, it's going out into a parking lot and it's going on to basically an open trailer. Our ATVs, they're being put in a crate. Right, it's surrounded by cardboard and uh, it's made out of wood, heat treated wood in some cases. This means we can't very well store it outside. It has to go into a protected warehouse for not only the elements but also for security. They're a little easier to steal than some of the automobiles, I believe. So we have to rely on a, uh, a warehouse and we did start out using our own warehouse and we quickly found that that was not working for us and we switched to 3PL. Why? The scalability. 3PL was able to adapt their space to our needs. We were producing a little, they gave us a little space. Ramp up, as you mentioned earlier, very quickly our production, and they were able to provide us all the space we needed. You can't go wrong when you're somebody like us in using a 3PL, and so we've been very happy with that. On the, again, on the outbound side, on the international side, uh, we had some great ideas for uh, setting up uh, shipments ourselves through our own logistics company. And I think, uh, Tim, you mentioned about having your own company. Ultimately, what we have found is uh, that it's better to let our customers select the Ford. And uh, there's a lot of reasons behind this related to exchange rates, related to freight rates, related to needs and conveniences. And, and, and so in spite of our earlier plans, ultimately, this is what we're going with. The customers are the ones who are choosing which freight forwarder to use how the product is going to be shipped. The challenges on the outbound side. 
Again, you look at those and you start to say, well, hey, I know about all these already, and you do. They're the same challenges that we're all facing, the equipment availability. But let's go into a couple of specific details about equipment availability. Uh, for us on the outbound side, remember, we're putting stuff in containers and shipping them out. Container availability, this is what we're really talking about. Sure, yeah, maybe we have a problem where a trucker or a piece of equipment can't come in on a certain day. But I'm talking about over the course of a month, being unable to ship 30% of our production capacity because we can't get enough containers into Northwest Georgia. This relates directly to some of those issues that Curtis was talking about earlier about the inbound containers and the outbound containers and no more backhauls. Getting those containers and getting access to those open containers for us was a very real issue, really harming our sales. So that's a continuous challenge for us. Uh, another one that maybe doesn't affect people so much and it's not so obvious, but it is for us. As we're expanding and as we're growing, we're moving more and more into the developing markets. The developing markets, of course, you, know, you can imagine uh, the countries I'm talking about. And when you go to those places, the security levels are not quite the same as what you might expect in other places. What we encounter then, of course, is some sort of loss or theft. I'm sorry, loss or theft. Now, where did the theft, if it was a theft, where did it take place? Our assumption is that it took place overseas. But we had a couple of uh, two real-life examples where the theft actually occurred here in the United States. Getting the feedback from the people who were involved in the transportation, of course, has been very difficult. But understandably, uh, we're all busy. The real problem we have is getting the feedback from the insurance companies who are reluctant to even assign an investigator to it. And of course, getting the feedback from the police who are absolutely overloaded in every country you work in with other issues that they're dealing with already. How can we get them to devote a little bit of time to somewhere between ten and $100,000 loss in ATVs, which appear to have been stolen? Well, we can't even say exactly where the theft occurred. That's one of the uh, uh, less obvious examples. The final one there, I think, if I say those two words, regulatory compliance, we'll all nod our head here together and say, yes, we know the issues we're dealing with. Again, a specific issue we have with that we're dealing with right now is a uh, common understanding of what that compliance is. We are shipping ATVs which have battery acid in it, and it's considered a hazardous good. The acid itself is. The battery is not a live battery, but the uh, acid is in a box. It's overpacked. We've got all the marking necessary on the crate, and of course, maybe you know about the changes to uh, the uh, hazardous goods packaging, removing the uh, English words on there. Is the marking also required on the outside of the container or not? Differing opinions depending on which uh, people you're dealing with, which carriers you're dealing with, and even the people who are working at the ports reg regarding whether it should be identified outside at all, on one side, two sides, four sides. And again, I see a lot of heads on it here. Regulatory compliance, whether it be uh, number of hours or any of those sorts of issues, it's got to be something we're all dealing with. It continues to be an outbound challenge for us. I believe that brings us to about the end of everything I have to say here. Yes, so let me just go back and say very quickly then, what are the things to take away from my billboard advertising here concept with the presentation. Well, on the inbound side, for us, Port of Savannah equals success. That is the, the big thing for us there. And then on the outbound side, the 3PL warehouse, that is what has really turned things around for us. We can't go wrong so long as we're using the 3PL warehouse. Thank you. What would you see as a, let's say, a high point uh, in your dealings with logistics suppliers, both inbound and outbound, over that 10-year period? High point. As in a positive point, uh, well, let's say, uh, let me talk about, uh, again, coming back to a short reiterate on what I mentioned in the presentation there, and that is the, uh, the ultimate change to allowing our customers to uh, designate to the board would be when we originally set up the business, we had these huge plans for being able to program not only our production, 
and also being able to program a shipment all the way into our customer's warehouse in France, in Germany. We envision being able to draw the production schedule and drawing it all the way out to the day that it arrived in the dealership in Italy. And those great plans were all uh, uh, ultimately for naught for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them was, as I think I've touched on briefly, the uh, freight rates and the variability of the freight rates. But another one was the weakening of the U.S. dollar. That has been both good and bad for us. As the U.S. dollar weakened, of course, there was more and more interest in our product from overseas customers. We were doing all of our business in U.S. dollars, and their euros, their uh, Canadian dollars, their Australian dollars, their uh, Brazil uh, uh, real, they were all buying more and more of our ATVs, and it was a great benefit to us. I believe what we also found, though, was that containers themselves were being moved into other markets, such as the Europe to China uh, lanes, rather than the U.S. to China lanes, because the uh, Return on and the investment there just wasn't as high as it would be used to be used in uh, Europe. That, together with the changes in the exchange rates, I'm sorry, the changes in the freight rates, said we could no longer price things through to our warehouse of our customer. We will say this is what it's going to cost, uh, your landed cost basically, uh, at your warehouse or even at your dealership, and be able to say that with any kind of confidence over the long term. We would have been issuing a price list just about every week if we were going to remain profitable doing that. Of course, we couldn't do that. Instead, we uh, tried to stabilize the price list and we said, okay, we wash our hands of this and we're going to let you buy on our next works on our next week basis instead. And this was good for the customers because their stronger Australian and New Zealand dollars allowed them and their uh, counterparts of you over there in Australia or counterparts of you in Denmark, for example, to negotiate better rates with certain providers uh, for the stuff which is going to see. So ultimately then, uh, the large plan that we have for being able to have total visibility of the product all the way down to the international customer didn't work. We do still have that kind of visibility to our dealers. We have a very good record every day of what the U.S. dealer stock is. And we maintain that kind of visibility. But unfortunately, it just didn't work out on the international side. Yeah. Thank you, Alan. I've got a number of questions myself, but just to be fair, I'd like to open up the floor. We've got a fair amount of time, so don't be bashful. We've got about 15 minutes or so. Uh, so please, uh, please. Let's start. Hello, this question is for Mr. Mike Smith uh, from Volkswagen. I'd like to say Dasato to you because uh, I have an 05 GLI that still looks and runs just as good as it was the day I first bought it. But I heard you mention earlier about the German way and what pulled your company through and, and allowed you guys to tighten up the ship and not have any more glitches in your system that would cause any type of failures. Is that kind of sort of like Kanban as referring to Japanese type manufacturing and or plants or how, do, how does that operate? It, it's actually a partnership of many different ideas, and that was the unique thing about Chattanooga is that we had a wealth of, of experience here. I mean, if you think back to when we started, GM and Chrysler had both claimed bankruptcy, so there were a ton of automotive people on the street. We imported a huge amount of those people. So we had the GM philosophy, we had the Chrysler philosophy, we had Ford, Toyota. So we, and of course we had the directives or the processes established by, by Wolfsburg. So we took a, a melding of those different ideas and kind of established our own swag in the way we did things. And I think it worked very well. And, it, and we do implement Kanban in certain areas and we do implement other processes in others. So. The, the P lane process is a perfect example. It's uh, it's based on a, on a, a Japanese concept, but we changed it to fit our needs. So, but and, and that's the way we do just about everything. We we take the best of what we can find and and we change it to suit our needs. So, thanks. Next question. Hi, my question is for Alan. 
I'm maybe I'm missing something, but I'm trying to get a grasp over your business model and your decision to sell to your customers on an XWorks or FOB basis. Can you give us a definition of what you consider your customer? Is it a wholly owned Suzuki dealership? Is it are you are they privately owned dealerships? I'm just trying to get an understanding yeah. of that. We uh, in each of the markets that we're dealing with around the world, with roughly fifty-five to sixty, which is purchasing our product. Uh, we have sole importers who may or may not be a wholly owned subsidiary of the Suzuki Motor Corporation. Now, of course, Suzuki Motor Corporation is targeting certain markets and uh, in some cases buying what was originally a privately owned distributorship in that market and making it a wholly owned subsidiary. For businesses like that, uh, which have become the wholly owned subsidiary, it's not been uh, so important for us what the pricing model is, whether it's a CFR or an XWorks or what, with our uh, other customers. And, and the reason being is the consolidated sales are all being consolidated at Suzuki Motor Corporation with those types of sales. <clears throat> with the privately owned importer, the privately owned importer uh, sale is counted at our level in a different way. And it's important for us to be able to um, count more of a sale and to be able to include the freight in the sale. So that had some importance to us. We, like I said, had intended to program visibility as, uh, all the way out to the end by using our own logistics providers here in the U.S. who would uh, manage things all the way down to the warehouse, whether it be in, in Sweden or uh, Turkey or in Zimbabwe, and in one case where we've exported there. And in, what we were unable to do then was be able to choose our own provider who would be able to look into our system and then also look out and say, here's where the product has gone. I hope uh, that uh, answers your question. Instead of being able to use the one provider who will ship to every market around the world, we are instead I don't think mercy is the right word, but we're, anyway, we're allowing all of our customers who want to choose their own providers to choose their own providers. Product then is being shipped on a OCL, it's on a CMA, CGM, it's on uh, any shipping line you can think of, and any number of U.S. agents or representatives of the uh, company, which may be in Denmark or anywhere else, uh, are people that we're dealing with, and that pr presents a little bit of difficulty in providing total visibility because you're dealing with so many actors and having the product delivered. Uh, my question is for Mr. Smith. Um, I'm Adam Bruns with Site Selection Magazine. I'm in the middle of reporting a story about the rare distinction of achieving the LEED Platinum certification in Chattanooga, and I'm interested in uh, how, how much of a pain in the neck that was from your perspective, <laughs> and or conversely, what that, like you say, maybe what you've learned from going going for that. Well, it, first of all, it wasn't a pain in the neck. It was uh, it was taking extra steps to do the right thing. Uh, it, it's something we're very proud of. Uh, it's something that we all work towards. I, I would not be the foremost expert in in explaining it, but I. We do special things like collecting rainwater for our toilets and much like Tim's group and installing bicycles so people can ride to work and, uh, and shower and, and the different things there. Uh, LED lights, uh, low emission lights, low usage lights. So uh, when we incorporate something in the plant, it's a consideration. So in every aspect of everything that we do, we consider that in the planning. So I, I think it's our responsibility to do that, and I think we owe it to, you know, to our children's children to establish those processes and programs to do it that way. Thank you. Yeah, this is kind of, I know that uh, Georgia has attracted your businesses here because of our airport, because of our port of Savannah. How does our labor manufacturing wise compare to, and this might be directed more towards Volkswagen and Suzuki, 
How does our labor force, I know that like in the aerospace industry, we've got a shortage of machinists and, and such, but overall, how is our labor, uh, or how does that compete globally with the rest of the world? Alan, go ahead. Okay. Uh, actually, I don't know if there's anybody here from Georgia Power, but they would be the one who I think would be able to best to answer your question. And I know this because I've been dealing with this kind of thing through our local chamber of commerce and uh, the uh, education and workforce issues. Georgia Power identified uh, quite a while ago the fact that the skilled labor availability uh, was really dropping off, of course, as more and more people retire. And uh, we have some very good graphic examples that show up here in the area. Of course, uh, Georgia Power, I think, is looking specifically at the state of Georgia, but they are the Southern Company and, and cover three states, so they're probably looking out much further than that. But they have de identified, yes, uh, the demographic issue is definitely a critical issue as far as skilled labor. For us specifically, I don't think that uh, it is as great of an issue as it might be to some others because we're not using so much highly skilled uh, machinist type labor. For us, we had uh, exactly the kind of labor we needed here. We needed assemblers. We needed people who could put the parts together, uh, people who could follow the directions, and uh, of course, the, the union issue also played a role in it, and we found exactly what we were looking for right here in uh, Northwest Georgia, in part because of the, uh, the uh, prior existence of the uh, uh, carpet manufacturers who had the textile mills who had been going out of business around that time. Of course, larger products require more skilled machine type labor. Maybe you have another comment that you can add to that. Yeah, there, there were basically no automotive people here when we came. So the technical skills specific to automotive we developed or imported. So, and we've done a lot of things to increase that knowledge in our community. We have on-site training facilities with Chattanooga State College. Um, we have uh, partnership programs with other companies in the area like Vocker and our friends here from TVA and, uh, and, and the things we do jointly to develop people and provide opportunity in the community. But I, I think probably the Chattanooga State people in the schools in the area and the Dalton area and in Chattanooga saw the need for that and established programs to train people in those specific areas that made, made them very useful to us. And then, you know, the traditional management and, uh, and uh, the, the laborers and those type people, I mean, they're, they're phenomenal. Great work, that, great work ethic. Um, I've lived in many different places. I think you have a little bit more pride of ownership in the area. So I, I'm very impressed with what we've seen thus far. So. Yeah, we have time for two or three more questions. Michael, in your slides you had a bullet that said that you didn't have real infrastructure at the plant. I thought you had both NS and CSX in Chattanooga. I'm sorry? I'm you, you said there was no rail infrastructure? Infrastructure? Yeah. Uh, no, well, no warehousing. That was specific to the Okay, area. because it said rail, so I was wondering if you have both CSX and NS at this plant. Uh, we do have rail service. Uh, we use it for export, for shipping cars more than anything. Okay. Uh, we, 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 move, we move a lot. We have 42% of our suppliers, 17% of our parts are in Mexico. I mean, that, that is an area that we could really increase our usage of rail. Uh, what we found uh, and with some of the agreements that we have is that it it wasn't real competitive at the time we bid it, so I know prices have changed quite a bit since then. Mm -hmm. So, and, and we're, we're a benchmarking company. We go back and get the best price, or we attempt to every six months, so. so are you with a rail company? No, I have friends in the rail industry, <laughs> and I want to see them do more in Georgia. Well, there's so. three geniuses on the back row back there from Volkswagen. They're all your transportation sourcers and processes and servicers. Go see them there. Well, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is you're in Tennessee, and we have friends at TVA, and we know people in Tennessee. But yeah, TVA's back there in the back here. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to make one comment. If you want FTZ, and if you want better port credits, you need to do something with us in Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on that already, so. Anyone else? I didn't hear uh, 
either one of you mentioned sequencing. I'm big mouth. You don't. I don't need it. Yeah, we we have a major just in just in time, just in sequence operations at our plant. Yes. Okay, one more, please. Don't be bashful. I can't. Can you hear? How many of us? Hold on, one quick. Yeah. Let, let me bring the microphone over there. I was just curious to know which ones of you use the Brunswick roll-off for your rolling rolling stock that you import. Oh. That was an easy one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was an easy question. I, I know I, I threw a tough one on Michael, but uh, maybe Tim and Alan just very quickly. What do you see as that one top quality in a logistics supplier that would draw you to them again? And Michael gave an answer. I think it was honesty, dependability. Yes. Yeah. Tim? I think more than anything else, it's a sense of urgency. Okay? Because we take it very seriously, and if our partners take it seriously, we can sleep good at night. Almost every anxious moment we have in the logistics business is because someone's not as focused on providing the service as we are. If we could add to the two comments so far, I guess the other thing would be, uh, what would help us to select one would be you know, a good track record. We're always going to look at the track record of somebody before we make that ultimate decision. Thank you all very much. Thank you.